Our story begins in the 1940s. The world was at war. Advertisers were trying to give the entire military lung cancer, apparently, and comics were filled with heroes in colorful costumes. Most comics at the time, whether they admitted to it or not, were based at least in part on Superman and Batman. They were in turn based in part on pulp heroes like Savage and The Shadow. After the war, most doctors started smoking camels, again apparently, and superheroes were gradually replaced by western romance and horror comics. Frederick Wortham's book The Seduction of the Innocent started this moral backlash against comics in the early 1950s, and that resulted in a severe reduction to the number of comic books that were being published. It also resulted in the Comics Code, which made comics more tame, child-friendly, and kind of silly. DC Comics fared better than most, keeping Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman as standalone titles and moving others like Aquaman and Green Arrow into anthology series. DC wanted to update its Golden Age heroes, but didn't want to ignore the past, so they came up with a solution. In 1956, Julius Schwartz, an editor at DC, created a more modern or contemporary version of The Flash named Barry Allen. In 1959, Schwartz updated Green Lantern, again creating an entirely new character, he followed that up with a new version of the old Justice Society of America called the Justice League of America in 1960. So here we are in the 1960s and superheroes have made a resurgence in popularity. Now Jay Garrick, the original Flash, had not been seen since 1951 when All-Star Comics was cancelled. Garrick made a brief appearance in Barry Allen's origin. He was seen as a fictional character that Barry had read about as a child. And DC Comics could have left it at that. They could have had Jay Garrick be a fictional character and all the stories about Jay Garrick were stories that Barry Allen read as a child and that would have wrapped things up nicely but they took it one step further and in 1961 we got the Flash of Two Worlds that was in Flash 123 Barry Allen actually met Jay Garrick and he was said to reside on a parallel Earth that occupied the same space and time as Barry Allen's Earth but vibrated at a different frequency. The two heroes discussed it and they speculated that the writers in Barry's world had written about Jay Garrick and his adventures because they received some sort of psychic impression of Jay's real world exploits on his parallel Earth. So more team-ups between Barry Allen and Jay Garrick would follow, and in 1963, a guest appearance by Jay's old colleagues at the Justice Society of America happened in Flash number 137. A couple of months later, in Justice League of America 21, the heroes of the JSA met Barry's Justice League in what would become an annual team-up. That was the story where we first got the name of these two parallel Earths. The Jay Garrick Flash and the Justice Society was from Earth 2, and the new modern Justice League was from Earth 1. You would think that the Justice Society would be Earth 1 since those Golden Age heroes came first, but DC actually made them Earth 2 because they wanted Earth 1 to be the current DC continuity and that makes sense too. Either way, it's kind of confusing for new readers. So after that, the concept of parallel Earths became popular. It started to pop up in various DC comics, and a lot of those stories were one-off stories. World's Finest Comics 137 had Batman in an unnamed parallel world where there was no Batman and Robin was Superman's sidekick. Justice League of America 29 and 30 featured the Crime Syndicate of America, the evil Justice League counterpart from Earth 3. In Flash 179, Barry Allen found himself on Earth Prime, basically our world, and he actually met editor Julius Schwartz. By the 1970s, the multiverse had become a convenient way for DC to take characters that it had purchased from other companies, such as Uncle Sam from Quality Comics or Captain Marvel from Fawcett, and integrate them into the DC multiverse. Each company
company's set of characters was given its own parallel Earth, and so the characters from that company were integrated into DC Comics without discarding the years of continuity that they had built up. By 1985, characters from Charlton Comics were purchased by DC, including Blue Beetle, Captain Adam, and The Question, all of which we discussed in our previous video on Steve Ditko. Now, while the total number of Earths within this Silver Age continuity was said to be infinite, in reality, it reached just above 20. Of course, there were many other theoretical worlds that had yet to be discovered, explained, or described. Still, none of these alternate worlds got as much development as Earth-1 and Earth-2. Mostly Earth-1, because that was the main continuity at the time. So, 1985 was DC Comics' 50th anniversary, and around that time when they were merging in the Charlton characters, the company decided that the multiverse concept had run its course, and that what they really needed was to get rid of this whole convoluted multiverse idea and break everything down into one universe with one continuity so that new readers could easily understand what they were getting into. That's how we got Crisis on Infinite Earths. It was designed to take all of these worlds and merge them into a friendly environment for new readers. So, Crisis was a 12-issue miniseries which created a cosmic threat that destroyed nearly all of the parallel Earths and collapsed the remaining ones into a single unified Earth. The history of the new universe was chronicled in a two-issue miniseries called The History of the DC Universe, and that was immediately followed by reboots of Superman Batman and Wonder Woman. All of the doppelgangers were swept away, and with them, many of the trappings of the Silver Age that had spawned multiple Earths in the first place. So, Crisis on Infinite Earths would not be the first or last crisis event from DC Comics. In fact, crisis events have their own Wikipedia page. A few of the more notable ones, for our purposes anyway, included Zero Hour, Crisis in Time in 1994, Infinite Crisis in 2005 and 2006, and Final Crisis in 2008 and 2009. But let's just start after Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1986. The multiverse was gone, and in its place was New Earth and its post-crisis continuity. In the years that followed, fans and writers began to pine for all of the lost bits of continuity and the different characters that were lost, and many of these characters and concepts began to be reinserted into the continuity through the use of retcons. Of course, the irony of that situation is that it made the continuity more and more complex and more and more difficult for a new reader to understand, which, as you'll recall, was the entire point of this crisis experience meant to begin with. A good example of this was Supergirl. She was eliminated entirely because DC Editorial wanted Superman to be the sole survivor of Krypton. And that probably just sounded great to them at the time, but fans were not happy. Supergirl was reintroduced, but not as Superman's Kryptonian cousin. No, she was introduced with a more complicated backstory, and this just served to make things even more complicated. Her backstory was confusing and needlessly elaborate, and it just really worked against the goal of simplifying things for new readers. So, less than 10 years after Crisis on Infinite Earths, the concept of parallel universes was brought back in what was explained as hypertime. So, hypertime is similar to a multiverse. It's like an infinitely branching tree, each branch of which is a different time stream. And these tributary timelines diverge and re-emerge into the regular timeline. If it sounds weird and complicated, that's because it is. It was basically just a way to explain poor continuity without a multiverse. It was around this time that Elseworld stories started to pop up as tributary timelines. A, a good example of this is Power Girl. She was explicitly removed from her membership in the Justice Society of America, but she was given an Elseworld story where she was 
was a member of the JSA. The main timeline continued without her as a member, but more and more stories were being told in the Elseworlds series where she was a member, and then eventually in JSA Our Worlds at War, she was made a member, and so this was the tributary timeline feeding back into the main timeline, and continuity is ever-changing, and boy, was it just a mess. So, Jeff Johns tried to convince the company to bring back the idea of parallel Earths in Infinite Crisis. In 2005, he wrote a story about how the Superman of Earth 2 and Alexandra Luthor of Earth 3, along with some other characters, had survived the destruction of the original Crisis and had been living in this impenetrable crystalline barrier. So Luther's henchman Superboy Prime was hunching against the barrier, and every time he hit it, it would reorder New Earth's history. That's a great way to explain continuity, right? Someone just punched the multiverse. That's it. That's it. Someone punched the multiverse, guy. Relax. So Luthor gets free and he creates infinite Earths once again. And once he's defeated, they're all merged back into a single Earth. But somehow this leftover energy from his multiverse expands into 52 identical Earths. But those Earths are corrupted by Mastermind, who somehow ate the events from all 52 and altered their histories. And each one became its own unique thing. And the mainstream DC Comics universe was called Earth Zero, this time spelled with a number instead of a word. And so Morrison followed that up with a third crisis called Final Crisis. But this was not a full reboot. It did reinvent the new gods, and it did introduce some new concepts and characters. But by 2011, DC Comics tossed out the continuity again in favor of another total reboot. In DC's mind, if they created a sort of entry-level comic book universe, then they would say, sell more books and make more money. That's usually what the motivation is with any reboot. Simplify things and give new readers a place to jump on. But because of the nature of comic books, things inevitably get complicated again. So Flashpoint comes along and many readers did not understand that Flashpoint would be a total reboot. By the end of the series, DC had relaunched with 52 brand new series. And of course, they named this post-Flashpoint universe The New 52. 52 new series, 52 new Earths, and 52 new universes making up the DC multiverse. I love this concept. It's lots of fun. But DC never really capitalized on it. Basically, all the parallel Earths went to Grant Morrison for his Multiversity series, and everyone else concentrated on Earth Zero. And in 2014, Grant Morrison mapped out the entire multiverse in the Multiversity. It can contained an all-new Earth 2, spelled with the number 2, and an all-new Earth 3, ditto, and it contained the same Earth 0 that was created in Infinite Crisis number 6. It also illustrated the Speed Force Wall, the Source Wall, Limbo, and many other DC concepts. So 2016 comes along and we have DC Rebirth, which is a soft reboot of DC Comics. It took its name from Green Lantern Rebirth and Flash Rebirth, both written by Jeff Johns, both of which focused on returning the title character to an earlier status quo. So the purpose of DC Rebirth was to sort of synchronize the post-Flash continuity and the post-Crisis continuity, sort of cherry-picking the best bits from each and also, again, creating a new jumping-on point for new comic book readers. And that's where we currently stand. This 2014 map of the DC multiverse is still valid, although Rebirth has changed some of the continuity inside those universes, and so there are 52 Earths in the local multiverse right now, but due to several instances of time-traveling shenanigans that I will not get into right now, there is an infinite number of universes from previous incarnations of the multiverse that exist beyond those 52. Keeping it simple, incarnations of the multiverse are sort of suspended within a multi-multiverse, with additional multiverses existing as bubbles of grouped universes of which this local 52 is just one. And that is the DC Multiverse Explained. In 1960s The Brave and the Bold No. 28, the world was first introduced to the Justice League. That team included Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, and The Martian Manhunter. 
In contrast to the comic industry's love of a good origin story, writer Gardner Fox introduced the League as if they'd already been together for quite some time. However, this was not the first superhero team. It wasn't even the first team from DC Comics. 20 years earlier, in 1940's All-Star Comics No. 3, Sheldon Mayer and Gardner Fox created the Justice Society of America. Much like the Avengers, the Justice League has been in print for more than 50 years. However, if we include the JSA, DC's team has actually been in print for nearly 70 years. It would have been 80 years, but the JSA met its end after 1951's All-Star Comics issue No. 57. It didn't return until the Silver Age of Comics almost a decade later. DC reworked All-Star Comics into All-Star Western, which no longer featured any superheroes at all. The JSA's original starting lineup consisted of Dr. Fate, Our Man, The Spectre, The Sandman, The Atom, The Flash, Green Lantern, and Hawkman. The first JSA story began with the team's first meeting. Each member told a story about one of their adventures rather than the team going on an adventure together. As a matter of fact, this was actually the very first superhero crossover. All-American Publications, rather than DC Comics, published the Atom, the Flash, Green Lantern, and Hawkman at the time. Superman and Batman were established as honorary members. Basically, the rule was that heroes who had their own comic titles could only be honorary members. They simply did not need this type of exposure. DC Comics replaced The Flash with Johnny Thunder after issue number 6 due to this same rule. However, honorary member Wonder Woman was allowed to appear in the JSA starting in All-Star Comics number 8 despite having her own title. However, she was the team's secretary, so yeah. Uh, it, it was the 1940s, all right. To me, the most interesting thing I found while researching the JSA was that in 1942, they changed their name to the Justice Battalion for a bit, acting as an extension of the armed forces of the United States of America during World War II. Returning to the 1960s, when DC Comics decided to modernize the JSA, they changed the name due to the popularity of Major League Baseball and the National Football League. I guess leagues were all the rage at the time. The popularity of the Justice League eventually led to the team being given its own comic series in 1960 called the Justice League of America. The original Justice League ended up having 19 members all told with 26 members in Justice League International. Note that not all of these members were present at the same time. If we include honorary members, Justice League International, Justice League United, and a ton of others, every single hero who's ever had any association with any version of the Justice League brings us to more than 170 individuals, removing any duplicates. Of course, and this is true for our Avengers video as well, these are only estimations. It's very easy to eliminate too many heroes when removing duplicates from the list because of the sheer number of heroes who take on a name previously used by another. And don't get me started on heroes who take on multiple names over the course of their careers. I just wanted to take a moment to remind you, if you enjoy the video, then once it's over, please click the thumbs up button and share it on Twitter. It really does help me out, and I appreciate your support. Now back to our regularly scheduled video. The 2007 Justice League movie took place some months after the events of Batman v Superman. Bruce Wayne and Diana Prince are trying to assemble a team of metahumans to take on Steppenwolf and his army of parademons who are apparently on an RPG side quest for the three mother boxes left on Earth. Oddly, DC Comics never calls their interconnected cinematic universe the DCEU. Warner Brothers and DC executives apparently have no internal term for their collection of interconnected movies. In fact, it was writer Keith, yeah, I can't say that name, I'm gonna put it on screen, this guy. He coined the phrase in Entertainment Weekly. He wrote an article entitled, First Look at Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice in July of 2015, where he used the term as a bit of a cynical joke. Quote, it was my own phrasing when I used it in the story, it just seemed like the kind of thing they'd call it. 
Henry Cavill has expressed his own doubts about the DCEU when speaking about the negative critical response to Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, the actor stated, quote, even if Marvel didn't exist, we'd struggle. There was a style they were going for, an attempt to be different and look at things from a slightly different perspective, which hasn't necessarily worked. Joss Whedon took over as the director of Justice League from Zack Snyder following the tragic death of Snyder's daughter. In a somewhat controversial move, Whedon replaced musician Junkie XL with Danny Elfman. Elfman did have more experience, providing the soundtrack for Hulk, Avengers, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies, and Tim Burton's Batman movies, among others. As a result, Elfman's 1989 Batman theme was used in some Justice League scenes featuring the Caped Crusader. Turning our attention back to the comics, DC actually inspired the creation of both the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. Both were created after the success of the Justice League in the 1960s. Publisher Martin Goodman saw the success DC was having with their superhero team and gave comic book legend Stan Lee the job of creating a team for Marvel. As a result, Stan the Man developed the Fantastic Four, and unlike the Justice League, these heroes didn't always get along. Due to the success of 1992's Batman the Animated Series and then Superman the Animated Series in 1996, DC turned its eye toward a Justice League cartoon. Bruce Timm, co-creator of the previously mentioned Batman series, was tasked with bringing the project to life. Tim replaced Aquaman with Hawkgirl in his lineup of founding Justice League members. The series ran for two seasons starting in 2001 before it was retooled into Justice League Unlimited. Unlimited then ran for another three seasons and included a wide array of DC characters. The year was 1938, and National Publications was downright desperate for features to publish in its new anthology series called Action Comics. Two high school friends from Cleveland had also become pretty desperate. They'd been pitching their idea for a comic strip called Superman to different publications, and everyone had turned them down. Back in 1933, writer Jerry Siegel and illustrator Joe Schuster had published a short story called The Reign of the Superman. Side note, the dash in the title was only there because the name was printed across two pages. The name was spelled Superman as one word, so now with that one guy who always says, <laughs> well, actually, tries to tell you that it was originally spelled with a dash, you can put him in his place. Anyway, the story was published in January of 1933 in the third issue of the duo's own fan magazine called Science Fiction, The Advanced Guard of Future Civilization. The titular character was a telepathic villain who had more of Lex Luthor about him than of Superman. And so they reworked this story into a comic strip about a hero that could leap one-eighth of a mile, outrun a speeding train, and lift heavy stuff. And that brings us full circle back to 1938 when an editor who had passed on the comic recommended it to national publications. This required the duo to cut and paste their comic strip into a 13-page comic book story. It became the lead feature in Action Comics No. 1, changing both the comic industry and the world forever. Superman went on to sell millions of books every month, and every publisher began scrambling to put out their own superhero stories. Siegel and Schuster, two teens trying to escape Depression-era poverty by breaking into the comics industry, were now famous creators, but they'd also developed resentment toward the company that bought the rights to Superman from them for only $130. Now, to be fair, this comes to an estimated $2,257 when adjusted for inflation according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and its CPI inflation calculator. However, two grand is still a far cry from the millions that National Publications was bringing in off the success of Superman. In 1947, they sued National over the rights to Superman, and they lost. The company responded by firing the duo and removing their created buy credit. 
Decades later, in 1975, the pending release of Superman the Movie starring Christopher Reeve stirred up a controversy over the duo's treatment, and in response, they were given a lifetime stipend, medical benefits, and a credit going forward. During the golden age of comics, Superman battled it out with gangsters and criminals, unlike the supervillains and alien forces that would come in later years. For much of this era, creators Siegel and Schuster were still on staff at National Publications, which was already known as DC Comics as early as 1940. However, other artists and writers were becoming increasingly involved in telling stories about the Man of Steel. In 1954, the Comics Code Authority was established to protect children from the evils of comic books. Superman changed with the times, and within a couple of years, the Silver Age of Comics was underway. Comic book storylines became silly and campy, and while the Golden Age had its fair share of campy goodness, the Silver Age was different in that the silly was all you got. Superman's increase in powers and abilities had been going on throughout the Golden Age, but accelerated during this time. At times, Superman's had telekinesis, telepathy, hypnotism, and super ventriloquism. Side note, the start and end date of most of these eras are debatable, as these types of changes happen gradually. How many ages there are, what they're called, and when they begin or end, it's always been debatable. One school of thought places the end of the Silver Age as happening around 1985 when the DC Universe rebooted with a story arc called Crisis on Infinite Earths. However, this school of thought leaves out the Bronze Age entirely, which is often said to have started in 1970 when Jack Kirby left Marvel to work for DC. Likewise, the modern age is often said to have begun around 1986, a year after Crisis, and the same year DC Comics released Watchmen and Batman The Dark Knight Returns, both written by comic book legend Alan Moore. For our purposes, we're skipping ahead to 1992 with Superman Volume 2, Issue 75, The Death of Superman. By this time, the newly rebooted versions of Clark Kent and Lois Lane had been dating and the two lovebirds were engaged in Superman number 50. The team that had been writing the story arc had planned a huge wedding and wanted the couple to tie the knot around issue 75. Unfortunately for our mild-mannered reporter, Warner Brothers, which owned DC Comics by this time, had plans of their own. They wanted to do a new TV series based on these two lovebirds and were worried that having them married in the comics would kill the will-they-won't-they -they vibe in the show. So what's the writer's room to do? They needed a big event that they could pull off in issue 75 to replace the wedding. Now, I'm not sure how they came up with the idea to kill off Superman as a replacement for his marriage, but I like to imagine that they were engaged in a game of fuck, marry, kill when one of them suddenly jumped up and yelled, I've got it! But now we're all caught up to 1992's The Death of Superman, and I'd like to tell you guys the story. Now, I'm no Benny, and I don't intend to do this often, but I'll try to do the material justice. The story begins with Doomsday, a monster bound in green leather with bone protrusions all over his body. He punches through the wall of the prison he's contained in and jumps to freedom. Traveling through the forest, knocking down the trees, he eventually finds civilization and proceeds to wreck a bridge filled with cars. Booster Gold and Maxima are the first responders from the Justice League, and along with Guy Gardner and Tora, they get to work saving civilians and putting out fires. Bloodwing gathers a group into Blue Beetle's Flying Beetle, and they head out looking for whoever or whatever caused this devastation. However, the group gets too close too fast, and Doomsday sees them first. He throws a tree at the Flying Beetle, and its destruction sends everyone flying. And by the time everyone is safe on the ground, Doomsday is long gone. Our heroes give chase, and they find Doomsday on a street, destroying every car in his path. Gardner jumps in, but Doomsday catches him by the head and puts him down. He never had a chance. Fire uses the full force of her abilities on Doomsday, but it doesn't even phase him. 
Doomsday grabs Blue Beetle by the throat and starts ramming his head into anything and everything as Beetle literally begs for someone to help him. Booster Gold angrily storms into the fight, but Doomsday punches him so hard that it sends him flying through the sky, where he's caught by Superman. The Man of Steel has arrived. Superman lands with Booster Gold just as Doomsday throws Tora through a house. The Man of Steel steps up to Doomsday and takes the full power of his punch and doesn't even flinch. But Doomsday kicks him and Superman goes flying through the house and into a tree. As the Justice League regroups, the remaining heroes attack with all their might at the same time, but it's no good. This entire time, Doomsday has had a hand literally tied behind his back, presumably from back at the prison. All they've done is set the hand free for him. Doomsday laughs. He throws Superman and grabs Booster Gold by the throat. As Doomsday throws Booster, Superman and Bloodwing attack from two fronts, but it's still no good. Doomsday punches them both at once and he jumps to freedom. Superman won't give up though. He gives chase and flying at top speed, he catches up to Doomsday and they begin to battle it out. The battle rages on and on and eventually the two end up making their way back to Metropolis. Superman tries to fly Doomsday into space and away from the city, away from the civilians, but Doomsday knocks the breath out of the Man of Steel and they land in the middle of a construction site. Superman realizes this could be it and gives Lois Lane what could be their final kiss. He tells her that he loves her and he flies into battle to put Doomsday down for good. Doomsday's bone protrusions are so sharp that they actually cut the Man of Steel and he begins to bleed. While the two continue to battle it out, Superman starts to break off the sharp bone protrusions that stick out of Doomsday's body. And after a long, hard-fought battle, Superman lays on the ground, bleeding. In his last dying breath, he whispers to Lois, Doomsday, is he? You stopped him, she replies. You saved us all. Sadly, this was the time Superman didn't make it back. Superman's had many changes and revamps over the years. Two poor teenagers in the Depression era went looking for the American dream, and in finding it, they captured the imagination of fans, writers, artists, and society as a whole. The public has maintained that interest and enthusiasm for nearly nine decades, from the Golden Age strongman to the silly Silver Age hero, and into the modern mainstream, Superman really is an icon. It's an idea that will outlast us all. If someone brings up the 1966 Batman TV show in conversation, they probably used the word campy. It might as well be the show's official adjective, and boy, is it ever campy. No, never again will that ghastly girdle thwart my plans, for I, the clown prince of crime, have found the answer to it. What is it, Joker? My own utility belt! Gee, terrific! However, shark repellent bat spray aside, why is it so campy? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Batman first debuted in Detective Comics number 27 in 1939, and he was anything but campy. Bob Kane and Bill Finger created the character, although Finger would not get the proper recognition he deserved until after his death. Back in the totally boss year of 1954, the Comics Code Authority was created to regulate the types of stories, language, and themes allowed in comics. Soon, the days of violence, gore, and sexual innuendo were over, but we live in the future, and we all know that this didn't last forever. 
Psychologist Frederick Wortham's 1954 book, Seduction of the Innocent, took aim at Batman, among many other titles, and Wortham claimed that children imitated crimes committed in comic books and that comics had corrupted the morals of the defenseless youth. He accused Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson of being lovers and claimed that the book had homosexual overtones, something that most of us have come to realize is perfectly natural these days, but I digress. As a result, Batman changed. Gone were the days of bat violence and in came a new era of silly, campy fun. Golden Age Batman often caused serious harm to criminals, would occasionally use a gun, and even killed a few villains in his time. Some of this change came from a natural progression in the superhero archetype. For example, rumor has it that this panel in Batman No. 1 resulted in a new rule that Batman could not directly kill anyone. This was in 1940, pretty early on in the golden age of comics. However, the tone and themes of the comics themselves shifted as a direct result of the comics code, and by late 1956, just two years after the introduction of the CCA, the Silver Age of Comics began with DC Comics Showcase No. 4 and a brand new Flash named Barry Allen. Often called Batman 66 and rebranded as Batman Classic TV Series in 2013, the show that debuted in 1966 was simply called Batman. It was a 30-minute primetime live-action TV series that ran until 1968 and was still in reruns when I was a child in the 1980s. William Dozier was both the producer of the series and the iconic narrator that began and ended each episode. The sands of time run out for the boy wonder. So novelist Eric Ambler was hired to write a serious script for a Batman TV movie. However, Dozier, after reading several Batman comics, decided that the show would only work if it was done as what he called pop art comedy. Again, this came a decade into the Silver Age of comics, and so the books Dozier picked up were not the same Golden Age Batman stories the creators of the 1940s Batman serials would have read. Instead, he ended up with the CCA-approved Silver Age Batman. Honestly, one could see why he had trouble taking the material seriously. So why was the 1966 Batman TV show so campy? Well, simply put, it was a product of its time. The comics code had ushered in an era of silly comic stories with less violence and more child-friendly fun, and when the show aired, the Silver Age of Comics was a decade old, and a person buying a new Batman comic in 1966 would find plenty of silly, campy fun both on the screen and on the page. In much the same way, the 1986 limited series Batman The Dark Knight Returns and the 1989 one-shot Batman The Killing Joke influenced the 1989 film adaptation of Batman. It too was a product of its time, based on the current form of Batman in print at the time it was conceived. Ignoring a couple Batman films that were clearly created as extended commercials, this trend continues. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through Batman Begins, released in 2005, took some inspiration from 1987's Batman Year One, as well as 1996's Batman The Long Halloween and 1989's The Man Who Falls. Even the 2016 movie Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was inspired by The Dark Knight Returns and the 1992 story arc The Death of Superman. All of these comics have a couple things in common. They were dark, gritty, and serious, and they were influential books that did much to define the modern age of comics. In the same way that the 1966 Batman TV series and feature film were influenced by the Silver Age comics of the time, so are our modern big screen representations of Batman influenced by the modern age of comics. In short, 1966's Batman was campy because it was made in a time when Batman was campy. Hey guys, once again, I'm Jay, and this time I'm here to share my list of five evil Batmen. 
Now let's get this intro out of the way quickly so that we can bring on the Batman. The world's greatest detective debuted in Detective Comics number 27 in 1939. Batman was created by artist Bob Kane and writer Bill Finger, and he was said to have been influenced by Sherlock Holmes, Zorro, The Shadow, and sketches by Leonardo da Vinci. The question of whether or not Batman goes too far or not far enough is the subject of great debate, but let's take a look at a few versions of Batman that definitely went too far. Number 5, The Bruce. I, Joker is an Elseworld story that takes place in a distant alternate future. In this reality, Batman, or the Bruce as he's called in the story, is a title that's passed down from one person to the next. Thing is, Batman is the leader of a cult that rules the world. The cult's preacher is known as the Gordon, because of course he is, and everyone who opposes the Bat Cult is captured, brainwashed, surgically altered into a member of Batman's rogues gallery and then ritualistically murdered. Every year, the Bruce goes after them and the cult cheers him on as he tracks down and murders each one. Of course, I'm not going to give away the ending, but the comic is told from the perspective of Joseph Collins, who's been captured and turned into the Joker. It's a wild ride, you guys. Number 4, Leatherwing. There have been at least two versions of Batman called Leatherwing, of which I'm aware. There's this guy who first appeared in 1994's Detective Comics Annual Number no. 7 and is also a pirate because, eh, why not? And then there's this guy who first appeared in 2007's Countdown to Adventure No. 2 and is also a Clearly, the latter is the evil Batman we're featuring on this list. Earth-10 is a world in which Germany won World War II. As a result, everyone is separated based on their genetics, those deemed inferior are killed, and the remaining used to breed. It's dark, depressing stuff for sure. Leatherwing, along with other DC counterparts, including Overman, who I mentioned in my Five Evil Superman video, are appointed by Hitler to be his heroes, and they form the JL Axis. They're opposed by a group called the Freedom Fighters, led by a hero calling himself Uncle Sam. Number 3, Asbats. I wanted most of the entries on this list to be actual alternate versions of Bruce Wayne. I don't mind using the occasional second generation hero or clone. I mean, I did pick Webman in my Evil Spider-Man video. So the next couple of entries are not really Bruce Wayne, but they're still worthy. Asbats is a portmanteau of the names Azrael and Batman. John Paul Valley, going by the name Azrael, was an assassin in the Order of Dumas. Batman attempted to rehabilitate Azrael and even went so far as to appoint him as the new Batman while Bruce Wayne recovered from a Bane-inflicted broken back. However, old habits die hard, and this new Batman began to murder criminals and activity Mr. Wayne certainly did not approve of. Well, he kinda just allowed them to die, but nevertheless, Batman returned to active duty, defeated Azrael, and the status quo was restored. Number 2, Black Lantern Batman. The blackest night falls from the skies. The darkness grows as all light dies. We crave your hearts and your demise. By my black hand, the dead shall rise. That little ray of sunshine is, of course, the oath of the Black Lantern Corps. Led by the Lord of the Unliving Necron, the Black Lanterns are basically reanimated bodies. From the unknown depths of Sector 666, the Black Lantern Rings descend upon entire worlds and claim the dead. I'd say that you can't make this stuff up, but clearly someone did. So, what happens when a Black Lantern Ring finds its way onto the corpse of the Batman? Nothing good, that's for sure. Necron used the Justice League's emotional connection to Batman against them, and thus, this happened. Now, it was later revealed that this body was a clone, but still, it's Black Lantern Batman. It's so awesome. Check out Blackest Night, it's only three issues, and it's really fun, and also dark. Number 1, The Dark Knights. So this time, we're going out with a bang. Rather than end with the most evil Batman I could find, we're ending with a whole team of evil Batman from the Dark Universe. As we've discussed many times, the Dark Knights were formed when an alternate version of Bruce Wayne, known as the Batman Who Laughs, was given the task of finding other evil versions of Batman by Barbados. They made their way to Earth Prime with some unwitting help from the Court of Owls, who were killed for their trouble, and Barbados drained the life force from Superman and Wonder Woman 
woman, leaving them incapacitated. You guys, I had so much fun with this one. I had never read Dark Knight's Metal, and so I had never read any of the tie-ins that introduce these alternate versions of Batman. I read all seven tie-ins and all of Dark Knight's Metal at once. This was for the original version of this video on Comic Storian. But even that wasn't enough, right? So I looked up a reading list and tracked down every related issue from any book that I could find, and I ended up making not only the original version of this video for Comic Storian, but also an individual video for each of the seven Dark Knights. And the funny part is, all I needed for the sake of the video were the seven tie-ins that tell the origin stories. But my obsession with Batman aside, let's run down seven evil Batman for the price of one. And if you're still interested, you'll find a card in the upper right-hand corner leading to the seven Dark Knight videos that I made for the End to the Omniverse series. So here they are in a mostly random order. I did put the leader of the group first. The Batman Who Laughs was a jokerized version of Batman from Earth-22. As previously stated, he was the leader of the Dark Knights. His goal was to help his master Barbados plunge the multiverse into darkness. Like all the Dark Knights, he came from a universe within the Dark Multiverse, which has been described as a shadow under the primary multiverse. A malformed world of nightmare where every fear and every Every bad decision plays out. Joker and his goons killed Batman's entire rogues gallery, used some sort of chemical to dissolve Commissioner Gordon, blew up buildings all around the city, including hospitals, and infected a bunch of children with the Joker toxin after killing their parents. Batman broke his one rule and killed the Joker. However, he later told Superman that even though he had to take out Joker, he refused to slide down the slippery slope. He would not become a monster like Joker wanted. Sadly for Batman, when he killed the Clown Prince of Crime, he was exposed to a new strain of Joker toxin, and it rewrote his mind to become more like that of the Joker, causing him to first kill the entire Bat family, then the Justice League, and eventually the entire world. Moving on to the Devastator, we find Earth-1, where Superman lost his mind for some unknown reason. The Blue Boy Scout murdered Lois Lane and went on a rampage, just slaughtering people indiscriminately. Batman, unable to find a way to return Superman to sanity, tried to take him down with a kryptonite-tipped spear. Superman taunted Batman, describing his disappointment in Batman's attempt to fight him, but the spear was just a distraction. Batman injected himself with a modified version of the Doomsday Virus and transformed into an amalgam of Doomsday and Batman, and then easily killed the Man of Steel. Unfortunately, in his desperation, the Dark Knight had caused the virus to spread to everyone, turning them all into mindless monsters. Next up, we have Earth-11 and Bryce Wayne. Now, Earth-11 in the normal DC multiverse is a gender-swapped alternate version of Earth Prime. Earth-11 is a dark version of that universe, as is the case with all dark universe worlds. Bryce Wayne's love interest was called Sylvester Kyle, see what they did there? And after Kyle was murdered by a group of rogue metahumans, Batwoman went on an 18-month killing spree, taking out every single metahuman on the face of the Earth. Aquawoman and the Atlanteans eventually came to the surface to talk peace with the surface world, but Batwoman was suspicious. When the peace talks break down, she's proven correct, and in a totally logical and necessary move, she surgically alters her own physiology and genetics to better combat the Atlanteans. Batwoman takes over Atlantis and submerges the entire Earth underwater. That brings us to Earth-52. In this universe, Batman lost many different Robins over the course of his career and became obsessed with bringing them back. Batman uses the weapons of Mirror Master, Captain Cold, and other villains to capture the Flash and chain him to the Batmobile, which he had modified using the blueprints for the Cosmic Treadmill. Batman drove directly into the Speed Force itself, and as a result, the two heroes were fused together. Batman gained a corrupt connection to the Speed Force, while Flash became a second consciousness inside his head. I'm sure you've guessed what happened next. The Caped Crusader uses his powers to go on a killing spree eliminating his entire rogues gallery. Then we have Earth-44 and the Murder Machine. In this universe, a group of supervillains led by Bane broke into the Batcave and murdered Alfred Pennyworth. Bruce Wayne was distraught, and while gathering with the Justice League to mourn Alfred's death, he asked Cyborg for help. 
Bruce had created a digital copy of Alfred's consciousness that he hoped to fashion into an artificial intelligence. He called this the Alfred Protocol. Cyborg agreed to help, but the AI version of Alfred soon began to act very hostile toward anyone except Batman. When the Alfred Protocol began killing Batman's enemies, Cyborg wanted to destroy it, but Batman, unwilling to lose Alfred again, refused and decided to try and reason with the new AI. Unfortunately, Alfred merged with the Batman and in the process took away all his fears and along with it, his humanity. Batman, in his new evil Tony Stark persona, slaughtered all the remaining criminals and the Justice League without a shred of remorse. And since this is likely the longest number one on any list I've ever done, we'll move right along to The Merciless from Earth-12. This was a dark version of Earth-12 where Batman and Wonder Woman were together. The God of War created a helmet that amplified his powers, and Batman and Wonder Woman vowed to defeat Ares and destroy his helmet. After two years of war, they finally confronted Ares, who killed Wonder Woman, leading Batman to put on the helmet in a desperate attempt to make him pay for her death. After using his powers to kill Ares, Batman saw that Wonder Woman wasn't dead, but when she tried to remove the helmet, he killed her rather than give up its power. And of course, he went on a killing spree, murdering all the criminals and heroes who tried to stop him. Last but not least, we have Earth-32, where Bruce Wayne, after witnessing the death of his parents in a dark alleyway, is found by a Green Lantern ring. Things go bad quickly, as Wayne's willpower is too much for even the ring to handle, and he forces it to obey an order to kill his parents' murderer. For a moment, it even looks like he can command the ring to bring his parents back, but it only manages to reanimate them for a moment. He then proceeded to go on a murderous rampage, shocking, I know, and kills a string of villains before being confronted by Jim Gordon. This confrontation does not go well for the commissioner. After the Green Lantern Corps arrives, Bruce makes pretty quick work of them as well. All of these comics end the same way, with the dark universe they take place in beginning to crumble away as the Batman Who Laughs appears to ask that incarnation of Bruce Wayne to join the Dark Knights. That is, except for the Batman Who Laughs, his story continues in Dark Knights Metal number 4. So, Superman needs no introduction. The Man of Steel has been around for more than 85 years, and his story has been told and retold countless times in every format imaginable. However, back in 1938, no one had ever heard of Superman. National Publications, which would later become DC Comics, was desperately searching for features to publish in its new anthology series called Action Comics. Meanwhile, two high school friends from Cleveland named Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster had been pitching their idea for a comic strip called Superman to different publications and had been turned down a lot. So, 13 pages and $130 later, the deal was done and Superman was the lead story in Action Comics number one. Spoiler alert, they managed to sell a few. So, we all know that Superman fights for truth and justice, but what if he didn't? That's an idea that DC Comics has explored quite a few times. Number five, Superman Red Sun. What if Superman didn't fight for the American way? What if he instead fought for the Russian way? This was the central conceit behind Mark Miller's 2003 miniseries Superman Red Sun, which gave us a glimpse into an alternate world where Kal-El landed in Soviet Russia and, as a result, was raised with communist values. Now, I may have grown up in Cold War America, bombarded by anti-communist propaganda, but I still know that all communists can't be automatically evil, and this version of Superman wasn't evil either, at first anyway. He even flew over to Metropolis and saved the city when Russia's Sputnik 2 crashed into the United States. Kal-El thrived in Stalin's Russia and eventually became dictator of the Soviet Union after the leader's death and later ruled most of the world, even going so far as to dictate the specific areas where new children would be born. Superman as a dictator. Put a pin in that, because it's an idea that we'll come back to again. Taking the idea of Superman as a beacon of freedom and flipping it on its head leads to some intriguing explorations of the man from Krypton. In addition to that, Red Sun turns a few other DC staples on their head. Batman is an anti-Soviet vigilante, while Lex Luthor becomes the President of the United States. So, was this Superman truly evil? I would say no, he was just misguided, but he did do some pretty evil things though. Still, this story is way too interesting to be left off the list. I won't spoil the ending, but it's one of my favorite Superman stories and I highly highly recommend it. 
Number 4, Ultraman. Created by Gardner Fox and Mike Sikowski, Ultraman was introduced in Justice League of America number 29 in 1964 as a Kryptonian from an alternate universe. During his voyage to Earth, he encountered some kryptonite, but unlike Superman, it didn't make Ultraman weaker. Instead, it increased his strength and continued to do so every time he was exposed to it. Ultraman was depicted as power-hungry, brutal, and without remorse. He founded the Crime Syndicate of America, an evil version of the Justice League and conquered all of Earth. After discovering the home universe of Superman, the crime syndicate traveled there in an attempt to conquer it, where they were foiled by the Justice League. There have been many versions of Ultraman and the Crime Syndicate of America over the years. One of my personal favorites comes in the form of a New 52 era story arc entitled Forever Evil. Just, what a great title. It sounds like a jewelry store for supervillains. Let the homicidal maniac in your life know how much they mean to you with Forever Evil. Remember, it's not evil, unless it's forever evil. The story begins when the multiverse barrier is weakened during Apocalypse War. The crime syndicate travels from its home on Earth-3 to do what villains do and take over the world. Forever evil is worth your time. Number 3, Dark Side Superman. A lot of these stories are based on the idea that had Superman landed somewhere besides Smallville, things would have played out very differently. So what would happen if he didn't land on Earth at all? In John Francis Moore's Superman The Dark Side, Cal el landed on Apocalypse and was raised by Dark Side. Again, this Superman isn't necessarily evil, but he does do some very evil things as a pawn of Dark Side. Superman helps destroy New Genesis, but in the end turns on Dark Side and uses the power of Earth's Yellow Sun to defeat him. The story was first released in 1998, and Darkseid Superman's armor, which somehow gives him power via geothermal energy, is one of the most 1990s looking things that you will ever see. Number 2, Overman. The original version of Overman came about in Grant Morrison's Animal Man No. 23 in 1990. Overman was the result of government experiments, and the other heroes on this version of Earth were all modified clones made from Overman's cells. Unfortunately, he contracts some sort of sexually transmitted disease, and it causes him to go insane. So yeah, that was a thing that happened. Overman murdered everyone on this version of Earth, and then decided to commit side by setting off a doomsday bomb. All this was presented in the form of the Psycho Pirate's memories as he brought back characters who were killed off in the crisis. He tries not to bring Overman back, but can't make himself stop thinking about him. Overman is brought back, but ultimately defeated in a display of disregard for the fourth wall that puts Deadpool to shame. The other version of Overman, also created by Morrison, has a lot in common with the Superman depicted in Red Sun. He too was from an alternate universe, but instead of landing in Soviet Russia, this time maybe Cal el landed in Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia. So Red Sun was about a communist Superman, while Overman was about a Nazi Superman. Cal el is discovered by the Nazis and raised by Hitler himself. Hitler, inspired by a Superman comic book, oddly enough, renamed him Overman and used him to win the war and take over the world. There's not much to say about this one, except that it's really depressing. Moving on. Number 1. Injustice Superman. Was there ever any doubt in your mind about this one? Whether this version of Superman is the most evil is debatable, but I still feel like this series deserves the number one spot on the list. It's just that good. Not only was 2013's Injustice Gods Among Us a great video game, it was also a fantastic comic series. A prequel spanning the five years before the events of the game, this is my favorite alternate Superman series and my favorite complete story from Comic Storian. This story begins in an alternate universe, big surprise there, where the Joker tricks Superman into killing Lois Lane. Spoiler, he didn't take it well. If you've ever wondered what would happen if you mixed Mortal Kombat and DC Comics, well, now you know. It's called Injustice. And with the 2017 run of Injustice 2 completed, it's the perfect time to get caught up on this wild ride. Hashtag not sponsored. You guys know why Wonder Woman won't date Mr. Freeze? He gave her the cold shoulder. I'm just gonna, uh, <clears throat> I'm just gonna do the video now. I'm sorry. The real-world origin of Princess Diana of Themyscira is a little more eyebrow-raising than you might imagine for a Golden Age superhero. Wonder Woman was co-created in 1941 by William Moulton Marston and his wife Elizabeth. 
Marston was already well known for helping develop the polygraph, creating an apparatus that measured systolic blood pressure to test honesty, something that we know doesn't actually work now, but it's very likely that this invention played some part in inspiring Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. Marston's home life provided some other interesting inspiration for Wonder Woman. He and his wife Elizabeth regularly engaged in polyamory and BDSM behaviors that were particularly taboo in the 1940s. Wonder Woman was based in part on their polyamorous girlfriend, Olive Brine. The distinctive bracelets she often wore would become a part of Diana's iconic costume. Wonder Woman was a founding member of the Justice League and first appeared in All-Star Comics number 8 in December of 1941, but you guys didn't come here for terrible jokes and origin stories. So here's my list of the top five evil versions of Wonder Woman. Number five, Red Sun Wonder Woman. Mark Miller's 2003 miniseries Superman Red Sun was based in an alternate world where Cal el landed in Soviet Russia and as a result was raised with communist values. Some of you may recall this book from my Top 5 Evil Superman video, so let me say again that I'm very much aware that communists aren't automatically evil. However, while Red Sun Superman was more misguided than evil, he did do some pretty evil things. As dictator of the Soviet Union and later most of the world, his rule was so awful that he had to drug the water supply to prevent his own subjects from killing themselves. Frankly, there were no true good guys in Superman Red Sun, at least not in the traditional Blue Boy Scout sense. In much the same way that Red Sun took Superman as a beacon for freedom and flipped it on its head, so too did it take Wonder Woman and do the same. The Wonder Woman depicted in Red Sun was unfazed by the fact that the Man of Steel was a dictator, and when she finally turned against him, it was because he put himself and his fight with Batman before her safety by begging her to break the lasso of truth, crippling her in the process. She didn't have a problem with Superman's actions or his ethics, only his treatment of her in particular. Put frankly, she was complicit in his actions and would have happily continued to be complicit. Red Sun at its core is about whether or not the ends justify the means. Lex Luthor clearly believes that they do from the very start. Superman takes longer to come around, but eventually, comes to think the same thing. I'm not going to give away the ending, but let's just say that whether or not the ends truly do justify the means is left intentionally vague. In the end, this Wonder Woman is guilty of helping to prop up a dictator that eventually became ruthless and then taking her entire country to war just to get revenge on that one man. And for that, she makes the list at number five. Number four, Superwoman from the Crime Syndicate. Superwoman from Earth-3 was named Lois Lane, but make no mistake about it, she was an alternate version of Wonder Woman. An Amazonian by birth, she even had her own version of the Lasso of Truth, although her version was the Lasso of Enslavement, so yeah. Comics were never really about subtlety, were they? This original crime syndicate of America was created by Gardner Fox and Mike Sikowski in Justice League of America No. 29 in 1964, but the latest version came about during the New 52 with Wonder Woman making her first appearance in Justice League No. 23 in October of 2013. This Superwoman from the Antimatter universe was pregnant with Ultraman's baby, or so she claimed, but she also told Owlman the baby was his. Manipulating both men, she tried to turn them against each other. As it turned out, the baby didn't belong to either of them. Who did it belong to? Well, who do I look like, Maury Povich? <laughs> Tough crowd. The baby actually belonged to a prisoner of the syndicate, Alexander Luthor. As it turned out, she had manipulated her comrades into bringing him with them as a prisoner. She's not just evil, she's soap opera evil. Number three. Brunhilda from Earth-10. Brunhilda was one of the Valkyries of North mythology and a member of the JL Axis, an alternate version of the Justice League from Earth-10, where Germany won World War II and took over the planet, thanks in no small part to her involvement. Earth-10 was based on Grant Morrison's Animal Man No. 23 from 1990, which featured an alternate version of Superman that was a non- when the New 52 came along in 2011, Morrison got the chance to expand upon this idea and thus the JL Axis, including this n version of Wonder Woman, was created. So yeah, n Wonder Woman is an evil, ignorant racist who assisted an ethnic 
thing on a global scale. This one isn't much fun. Let's just move on. Number two, Flashpoint Wonder Woman. 2011's Flashpoint was a story arc that saw Barry Allen wake up in a world where he's not the Flash. However, the differences didn't end there. His mother was alive and his father had died of a heart attack but never went to prison. On top of that, there was no Justice League and, seemingly, no Superman. In this timeline, Diana, Queen of Themyscira, was leading the Amazonians in a war with Aquaman's forces in Europe. Wonder Woman had conquered the United Kingdom and renamed it New Themyscira, while the Atlanteans sank the rest of Western Europe. That's right, Wonder Woman as a warlord. I wanted to include this one for a couple of reasons. One, it's one of the few evil versions of Wonder Woman that exist without an evil version of Superman. And two, it's just a great story arc. Flashpoint consists of a core limited series and a number of tie-in books, and it's worth your time. Number one, Injustice Wonder Woman. <laughs> and I find myself in a position of saying once again, was there ever any doubt in your mind about this one? Whether this version of Wonder Woman is the most evil is debatable, but much like Superman, I feel that this series deserves the number one spot on the list just because it's that good. As a matter of fact, I think Tom Taylor is probably getting sick of me tweeting at him about it all the time. The Joker once said, All it takes is one bad day to reduce the sanest man alive to lunacy. Superman had his one bad day, and it made him into a dystopian dictator. As a result, Batman and the rest of the world had quite a few bad days as well. But every step that he took on that path, Wonder Woman was there with him, encouraging him to move on, to go farther, to do what needed to be done. Now don't get me wrong here, Wonder Woman didn't agree with every single thing that Superman did. She especially had a problem with the way he aligned himself with supervillains in order to beat Batman and his resistance, but she was definitely not a good influence on the Man of Steel. And if anyone in the regime is just as guilty as Superman, then it's Wonder Woman. At the time of this writing, the most recent issue of Injustice 2 was Chapter 51, which was released on March 27th of 2018. So now is the perfect time to get caught up with this critically acclaimed series. So just one more quick thank you to our wonderful patrons on Patreon. You can support the channel at patreon.com slash fancygeeks and get a video made on a comic or character of your choice. If you can't afford Patreon, then you can still be a huge help by sharing this video on Twitter, Facebook, or Reddit. And you can come chat with me directly on Discord, link in the description below. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. And until next time, guys, be kind to each other. I'm Jay Parks.